<laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for having me here and for all of you that are joining. That means the world to me. Um, I wrote lots of notes because I went back through my journey with cancer. And there's a lot of things that when you have cancer, you forget, right? You go back to your own reality and then you forget it. So I've kind of made notes and you'll see that I'm following through because I want to make sure that I follow the right guideline. Um, but the reason I wrote this book was to give hope and tools to others that are struggling with any, any kind of illness, whether it's cancer, emotional, physical, spiritual. And so I'll begin by saying in 2019, I heard a voice. Now, as a medium, I can hear spirit. So that wasn't anything that was shocking to me. I was kind of half awake and I heard this voice that said, finish your book, Proof of Miracles, as this is going to leave your legacy. I didn't think anything really of it at the time. I was just like, huh, I wonder what that means. Well, two weeks later, I heard another voice, but this one was stern. And it says, you need to get this out now. And what that meant was I was dealing with a hemorrhoid and the hemorrhoid had been bothering me for some time. And I had gone back like in November to have it checked. I had precancerous cells years before. So this was something when I heard this word, get it out now, it was something I needed to pay attention to. And I needed to trust it because I knew that it wasn't coming from me. So I proceeded to go um, make an appointment, see my doctor. And she was like, well, why are you here? I told you that we're not going to remove this. And I said, um, intuitively, I'm asking you to remove this hemorrhoid. And she fought me. She said, you know, this is going to be painful. This isn't something we usually do. And I said, I know with all my, my own intuition, with my heart, this needs to come out. And so I can remember her even leaning over the front of the table, like glaring at me, like, I don't think you understand. You don't need to get this out. And I said, I don't think you understand. I do need to get this out. So just sharing this because a lot of us listen to our doctors, but when we have a strong knowingness and an intuition within ourselves, we need to pay attention to that and be our own self advocate for our own body. So she removed it. And then she even questioned if she wanted to, to send it in for biopsy because it just, it looked like a dead little lima bean. And, and, I can remember asking to see it. And I said, yeah, we should probably send it in. And so she did. Two weeks later, on February 4th, I received the call as I was driving in the car, um, headed to my hair appointment for my doctor. And she says, where are you? She says, I'm, I'm driving right now. Oh, well, do you think you could go home? I said, no, I really can't, but I could pull over. Is there something you need to tell me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I turned, I pulled over to the side of the road and she said, I am so sorry, but you have cancer. And you, and, and, and I wasn't going to remove it. Like she's now she's speaking her truth. Like everything's coming out because she's feeling bad. Right. And it's just all the floodgates are coming out. And I, and I'm in just disbelief. Even though I knew to get it out, you never, when you hear that word cancer, you're never prepared for it, no matter what. You're just, you're not, whether it's a loved one that has it or you have it. So um, she says, you need to come in tomorrow and we need to set you up with uh, an oncologist and radiologist. And my brain is going, what, right? What's happening here? Okay, I'll be in tomorrow. She played it off lightly, like this was going to be easy. Cancer is not easy. No matter who goes through whatever cancer it is, it's not easy. Not mentally, not physically, not spiritually. It's not. So if somebody tries to tell you like it's easy, she wasn't just trying to soften it to make me feel better. She was softening it to make her feel better. So, okay, so now I'm going to meet with my radiation doctor. And I prayed before. How do I know that this is the right doctor or doctors? Because, you know, she's handing me the, to these people. It's not that I did any research. I'm, I'm trusting, but I'm trusting 
someone that I didn't really trust, right? So now I'm going to place this in my hands and, and prayers. Okay, God, show me, show me, show me that this is, these are the right doctors. So I have a girlfriend come with me. We go to the cancer center and it's, it's pretty eye awakening when you pull into that, that, that parking lot for the first time and you see cancer treatment center and you're like, I'm, I'm actually the one walking in for this. So I sit down and my radiation doctor comes in. He introduces himself to me and it's his first name is my son's for my oldest son's first name. I'm like, okay. All right, let's see what this is about. And he's very compassionate. And he says to me, so Deborah, what do you do for a living? I'm like, <laughs> oh. At first I just said I was an author and then I thought, no, you have to tell me your truth. Like what, what kind of author are you, right? And I said, well, I'm a healer. But how is how are my people, how am I gonna express this to the world? Do I hide it? Do I share it? What is, what is the reason for this? And that doctor looked at me and said, you're a healer. That means that you're just the vessel. We all are going to have issues with our own body and your body's having an issue. It doesn't mean that you're any less or any better of a healer. And I'm like, you are my doctor. You are my doctor. So he, I explained to him that I had this big ball in my groin right here. And I was, I had an appointment to go see my uncle, my OBGYN. And I had sp expressed this to the rectal doctor and she didn't seem concerned. He's like, oh, well, we're going to take a scan here in the office. So we took a scan in the office. And as we did, then I came back out and he says, Deborah, that big ball that you have in your lymph node is um, cancer. It's in your groin. You also have a tumor in your anal canal. So we're going to have to set you up for a PET scan to see if it's anywhere else, anywhere else in your body. Okay, what does this mean? I asked. Well, you know, there's going to be either plan A or plan, plan one or plan two. What's interesting about this, how God sets everything up. Plan one is I get to stay here in Arizona and I have to go through six weeks of chemo and radiation. Plan two means it spread everywhere in my body. And now I need to go to a rectal hospital that treats just for this for specialist. One, John Hopkins, two, Cleveland Clinic. My one son lives at, in by Cleveland Clinic and my other son works with John Hopkins. Okay, I'm gonna be, I know I'm gonna be okay. All right, so now you leave that office. What happens? What happens to all of us? our humanness starts to take place, right? And how do I how do I not spiral? Now my humanness is gonna take place and, and we all have emotions and we have to, have to trust those emotions. Our emotions are telling us our truth, but our brain can really mess with us. There's a difference. So my brain started like messing with me, well, what if this is the last, you know, what if, what if I'm not going to survive? What all the what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, and what ifs do not serve us because you're not standing in the now. So I had to reel myself back in and say, okay, right now, right here, I am safe. I'm okay. We don't know the plan, but when we get the plan, then I'll deal with the plan. Do you think that's easy? Okay. I said, that's the way I'm going to do it. Walk through grace. It's going to be fine. So now he says, you have to go see the oncologist. All right, go up to the floor three, meet the oncologist. And so nice to meet you. She says, hi, my name's Stephanie. Oh, that's my daughter's name. Okay, this, could this be real, right? So I, I, I proceed to ask her and say, you know, what are the chances with this type of cancer? And she says, well, you have HP cancer and um, it is curable, okay? So I heard the word curable. I'm gonna hang on to that word. 
And so that doesn't come with a lot of, you know, you still have to go through your scans. You still have to do all your blood works. And it, there's, there's a lot that entails with that. But I knew at that moment, this doctor is my doctor. She's speaking the truth to me. And she also is compassionate. I have to have a very compassionate person when I'm dealing with someone. I want to be heard. I want to be seen. Um, there was one day when my radiation doctor wasn't there and somebody else stepped in. And he was very direct, very harsh. And he was mm -hmm. telling me, and this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. And I could, I'm digesting all this fear and fear and fear. And I'm like, now I know why my doctors are my doctors. So you have to find which doctor's right for you. But trust your guidance, ask for guidance. And then when you when you feel it in your gut, like, oh, that doctor feels good, that's your doctor, that's your truth. Stand in it. Okay, so the, that evening, after I get this news, I'm flying out to California to take care of my daughter who had surgery. So I'm like, and the, this, the doctor's like, no, you should stay here and have your scans. I go, well, let's be really realistic. Insurance isn't going to like um, accept this scan at least for a few days. Let me go for the weekend. So he did. I can tell you walking through the airport for the, this time was different than any other time I've ever walked in the airport. I'm now walking through the airport going, will I ever do this again? I'm seeing little kids laughing. They're going to Disneyland. I'm seeing parents and everybody full of joy. And I feel numb. I don't have that joy. And I don't know where it went or how to get it back. I knew when I went to, when I arrived at my daughter's house, I had to be strong for her. But how do I be strong for myself? It was a good distraction. My um, grandson was there and to make some, some this light and fun. He was, he was not even two at the time. And I decided to take walks every day. And remember those little dandelions where they're, you, you blow and make a wish. Well, I taught him like, these are, I think he calls me Dee Dee's favorite flowers and we pick them and we make wishes. Well, to this day, that has been something that he'll never forget. And that was exactly what I was trying to do, because if I wasn't going to survive this, I wanted him to remember me. Okay, so I come back and I have my PET scan. Day of the PET scan, you have to sit in this one room. Guy comes in with a radioactive um, medicine with a metal box. You have to sit in there for an hour. Can't move, can't be on the cell phone, have to be straight so it can go into your body. During that time, I asked for a white blanket. And I'm sitting in there going, I need to use this as my God time. I placed that white blanket on me and I knew that that, that moment God was holding me. Time to walk in to have the pet skin. Facing all the unknowns. I can remember they make you put your hands up over your head like this as you lay down through the scan, right? And, you're, and as I lay down, went through the scan, and I asked for the white blanket on there, and I closed my eyes. And when I closed my eyes, everything became white, and the room was dark. I knew at that moment I was also being held by God. I was not alone. And you feel very alone. You feel vulnerable. But when you know that spirit's with you, you're never alone. It gave me so much peace. And I knew that no matter what I was going to find out, I would walk through it, not alone with my faith. faith. So I get the call. As I was in the bathroom of all times, my phone rings and I know that, oh my God, that's probably my doctor and I want to hear what he has to say. So now it's on the, like, on the message and I'm like, mm, I got to push play. Right now I'm alone. He's not even on the other end. And I'm like holding my breath, pushing place. Deborah, we did not see cancer anywhere else in the body. <laughs> right? You're just like, ah. You're like, okay, plan one. Now I have a plan. Right? You have a plan. How am I going to walk through that plan? I'm going to, you're going to have to walk through with my doctors, with my faith but also with my own courage. And courage is not easy when you're not sure of all the unknowns. 
So I can remember questioning God after I got that phone call. Okay, so why did I get this? What is the meaning of this? I heal other people of cancer. Why do I need cancer? I have, I mean, why not? I, you know, why not? I should, it's okay. But what's the reason for it? What do you want me to learn from this? Hmm. That became a really good question. What do you want me to learn from this? Then I decided um, it's not serving me to stay into all the whys, but just to be stand with grace and gratitude to where I was at this moment. I was facing my first oncologist um, push. It's a push where they're going to push um, myomitis, a myomidison injection into your arm. It's a really, really strong. On that first push day, I also was going to take nine chemo pills and in the morning and nine chemo pills in the evening. First day, facing my reality. How was I going to do it? So I put on army pants and I said, I'm going in with my army. I've got my team, my spiritual team. I have my friend by my side. And I have my own courage right here. I'm going in with my army. So I'm dressed for the course. Here we go. I got to take these nine pills. Uh, I don't want to take chemo pills. So I went and I got this beautiful tray. It has dragonflies on it. Dragonflies always remind me of my father. When I see them, I say hello. So I put the nine pills in this tray. I knew my father was standing next to me for, for every one I was going to take. I placed this up like this and I said, God, I'm blessing these pills. I, I'm going to remove, remove my fear. I'm going to say, I'm grateful for these pills because these pills are part of my healing. So instead of being upset and frustrated that I have to take this because that causes resistance, I'm not going to welcome you. And thank you. So I would take two. Thank you. The first time I was like, mm, thank you. Like you're not, I'm not really feeling the thank you. So I'm really kind of scared of what this is going to do. So now I got to go do my push. I go to the hospital, get my push. And I said to the nurse, can I just pray on the, the medicine before it goes in and give gratitude for it? She's like, wow, you have any idea, you know what this is going to do to you later? <laughs> And I said, yeah, but no, you're telling me, but I have really no idea. You have really no idea. When they say, oh, this is going to take you down, you think this is just going to take me down. I'm going to sleep. I get the push medicine. It takes me about an hour. I didn't feel anything. Didn't feel anything until the very next day. But I do have to say, go back to that. I wore a white blanket when I when I had that medicine putting in again. So that white blanket just seemed to be so symbolic to me every step of the way. The day later, I could um, I could barely walk. I had to take my dog out, and I remember calling my son and saying, "You need to be on Facetime with me because it might pass out. I don't know if I'll make it back inside." And I'm literally crawling on the ground. We have rocks outside and I'm sitting there. I'm like, I don't know how to get it in. And he's like, call your neighbor for God's sake. And I'm like, I just like, I thought I could do this and I can't. Right. And so it's like, oh. and so I'm having my moment. And that's what we need to do. We need to honor those moments. We need to feel those emotions. Those emotions are real. I can't just say, oh, I'm going to walk through grace the entire time. I'm going to have these moments where I can feel rough and and I'm not liking what's happening and and I'm a little upset with what's happening. I might even be angry. I have to walk through them. It's very healthy for you to do that. All right. So the next day, my friend brings me this gift that her daughter makes. It's this beautiful calendar and it has the weeks that I have to go through the treatments. This ended up being the best gift ever because now I have a goal and I'd come home and put a sticker on this. Like, like I was a little kid. I got a sticker today. I get to put it on the calendar. But as I went through, I was seeing like it's getting close to the end. 
I was able to finish my book, Proof of Miracles, while I had cancer. So actually, while during treatments, I was actually on a podcast with Suzanne Giesman sharing my book, Proof of Miracles, while I was going through cancer, not knowing the end of my story. Challenges through cancer. They tell you some of you might lose the taste, the smell. Some of you say you might not be able to tolerate smell. I got the not tolerate smell. I couldn't open the refrigerator, the freezer. I couldn't smell anything. If I smelled it, I was going to like throw up. Neighbors would start cooking for me, bringing in food because it could not be in my house. If I even smelled it to eat it, I couldn't eat it. I had brain fog, I had dizziness. I, it, it was just like, bring it on. What I did notice, one of the one things that I can tell you is I learned that I had to be very direct with people and I'm not a very direct person. I'm always like very compassionate. Oh, it's okay, right? And I was the one that took care of my kids. Now my kids are coming in one by one to take care of me. Real, real eye awakening because now you have to allow them to take charge. And let me tell you, my children loved being my parent. It was not fun, you know? And I think they still think that they're my parent now telling me and how I should live and what to do. But that was part of the that was part of the roles they played and I had to give up my role and it was not easy, but the one thing I tell you is always tell what you need and don't soften it thinking like I don't want to do that cuz I don't want to you know, I don't want to cause hardship on them. You have to speak your truth. If you don't, then there's too many miscommunications, then people get hurt and it just doesn't work well. Um and so you have to honor yourself. You have to be direct. And at one point that was really hard because I could not let my daughter come who had the grandchild to come visit and help take care of me. So the other kids could, and she couldn't, and it broke her heart to this day. She said, you made me feel hopeless and helpless. And I can't take that back, but I wasn't direct enough to tell her has nothing to do with you. I was thinking it's best if you stay home because I didn't want to take you away from your child. I didn't voice that, right? I just thought, no, 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 you stay there. I can't have grandkids, doctor says no. But you see, that wasn't direct enough and it caused pain. One of the things that they said that I couldn't have was sugar. So as I was going through my cancer, it was coming down to the end. I craved a bagel. I just craved this bagel. And my my boys were like, they're strict. You're following the guidelines. This is the way it is. And that's it. So I can remember one morning waking up and going, how am I going to get my son to let me to have a bagel? How am I going to do this? So I wasn't even going to voice it to him. I'm going to text it because he's in the other room. I'm lying like, um, what do you think we have an egg? I know he'll say, great. And like, on a slice of a bagel. Mom? <laughs> oh no, I'm in trouble like a little kid. <laughs> and I come on the couch and he calls my other son and they're like teaming up and they're like, you may not have a bagel. Why would you do this? You need to stand strong. And I'm like, but I know what my body needs. I'm now, I cannot hold my bowels. I'm, I'm miserable and I need some substance. Nope, not getting it. We're doing our part. This is our role. You can't have it. Okay, well, we know our bodies more than what our children know. And I know they meant well. So I was mad and I got on my computer and I was texting my doctor. Do you know what's happening here? And what can I have and not have? So Monday, we walk into the oncologist, son sitting next to me. How are you feeling, Deborah? Feeling pretty good, but, you know, I haven't been able to eat much. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my bowels and it's just very uncomfortable. And well, Deborah, now's the time you should be eight, eat anything you want. So like, you know, if you really want a bagel, you should be able to have a bagel. And I'm like, you know, laughing. My son did not think that's funny at all. So I, when we left, I looked at him, I said, well, are you to tell the siblings that I can have what I want now? And he's like, no, he was annoyed. No, no, he didn't like to hear that. Okay, so here we come to 
my last push. And the last push is going to be 28 days from the first push. I made it through everything. Um, I will say one thing else before we get to the last push. There was a time, probably the week before the last push, where I was super weak. And I knew that I was getting down to the wire. And my doctor, my radiation doctor says, how would you feel about not having treatment today? I was like, well, if that means that we just don't mark it off the calendar. And he's like, no, that means that you still have to, we have to add a day to your calendar. And I said, no, 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 this is my goal here. April 10th's my goal, not April 11th, April 10th. And he's like, I'm sorry, you can't have it. You're too weak. And this isn't, this isn't good for you. Okay. So I'm depressed, not trusting the process, right? So the push is coming. I'm super weak. And in my heart, not in my mind, because it wasn't a fear, because I knew the first push really put me under. So it wasn't like I was scared of having it again, because I had help this time. But this time it was in my heart, in my tuition, in my knowingness. If I have this, push, I'm going to die. I felt my heart would give up. How do I tell my kids that? Because you know them. It's by this. So you get blood work beforehand and you have to, you have to be in a certain range, right? For being able to have this push, your platelets have to be at a certain range. So I said a prayer before I said, God, I'm having these feelings and I don't know what to do. Can you guide me? Can you show me? I'm going to place this in your hands. What's best for me, for my highest good, what's best for me and my body. So we go get the blood work. Then we'll go to radiation. And the doctor calls us in the car after radiation. So she starts off, well, your platelets went up two points. Okay, well, what does that mean? Platelets went from 74 to 76. Okay. Protocol means you have to be at 100 or higher. We can't give you that last push. My son's mad. What do you mean you can't give us this last push? This is part of the protocol. She gets it on day one and day 28. And now if she doesn't get this, does it mean that she doesn't get her right treatment? Does this mean, you know, or are you telling me that you only put the protocol there because it's $19,000 and you want the money? Like he's pissed. And I said, I had to calm him down and go, it's not healthy for me, period. We can't have it. And we have to trust the process. Get off the phone. He's still annoyed. And I said, I explained to him what I felt in my heart before we even went. And I was crying. And I said, you have to trust this. I know that I wouldn't be here if I had it. I prayed. And here's our answer. That was on a Friday. So you don't have treatments on the weekend. Monday comes. You go get your blood work again. Blood work comes in and she goes, oh, your blood work jumped to 123 just in a few days. What does this mean? Well, your body's still really, really weak. We're going to do no more chemo. Now I think, no, no, we didn't do that. Now we're not going to do any more pills. Oh my gosh, the family's a little worried but you're gonna just finish radiation. You're gonna finish radiation. So now I'm taking my, not my tray, but I'm putting like the whole bottle on my tray. And I'm like, thank you chemo for everything you did for me, but we get to say goodbye to you now. So literally I was thanking it for what it did. So I can remember asking, um, God, during this whole process, what do you want me to learn from this? And I started asking cancer, what do you want me to learn from this? 
one of the things I learned as I was walking through this is I wasn't resisting it. I wasn't frustrated with it. I wasn't anger. I didn't have ang any ang any anger except for those few little moments here and there. And my radiation and oncologist said, we see people that walk with this attitude of gratitude and they just receive so much better. It really plays a big role in how your body um, raises that vibration. The other thing is we're always told to fight cancer. I never went in and said, I'm gonna fight you. We're gonna get this. You know, at the beginning I said, I'm gonna kick cancer's ass to my parent, my family. But afterwards it was like, but how am I going to do this? And what I, I learned is I was gonna embrace it with love. I was embracing those pills by praying on them, thanking them. I was, bra I was saying this to the ra radiation machine. I can remember walking in the very first day going, oh, this is big, this is scary, I'm so scared. First day I allowed myself to have that fear. But the second day when I walked in, it, it, my whole demeanor changed. And I was like, this was my God time. In, in that radiation machine, God gave me the words army for love. It became my publishing company. It became um, like this group gathering now, helping others walk through it with grace. And I had no idea what that meant at that time, right? But there was little nuggets that were were beautiful, and so I just kept saying, "I'm I'm hugging you. I'm hugging you." I used to call it my beast, the beast inside me. You know, you are my beast. And at the end of it, when I said goodbye to it, and I, I said, "I found my beauty in my beast." And what I found in the beauty was that I learned so much more than what I could have ever known what people go through with cancer. And as a healer, I thought that I could really hold their hand, that I, I was seeing what they were going through. I, I knew I could feel what they were going through. I had no idea. Not to this extent. No one does until they have their own journey. So now my lesson was I can walk with them. I'm not on the other side of the door looking in. I'm with their hold, holding their hand as we heal. It was beautiful. So I also did one other thing. And some people will, you have to do what feels right. I didn't like voicing the word cancer. I didn't like saying I have cancer. I didn't like to share and call people and say I had cancer. I told, told my family members and I had somebody else voice it to only a few selected people. I didn't tell people. Because I didn't want the energy out there like, did you hear Deborah Martin has cancer? That spreads. I didn't want that. And yes, people might think that, why didn't you? People could pray for you. For me, I just didn't want the energy. I was being very careful where I was placing it. I believe words are energy. I needed them to stay positive. And I also believe that um by voicing our truth standing in our truth and trusting the process and being our own advocate for our own body this is the way i had to work it so at the very end of treatment that was um in april 11th then in july you wait till july to have your pet scan some people call these PET scans like um, pet anxiety, anxiety scan. Scary. What am I going to see? What, you know, what's going to be there? And I'm going to have to go through these scans every six months for three years and every year for additional two. And if I'm cancer free through five years, it will be lifelong gone. So now I have a whole nother thing to do is walk through PET scans. What I decided to do is I was going to walk through and say, okay, God, this is your truth. This is your proof. I'm going to put it in your hands. Show the proof. So I remember going in this time. Guy comes in with the, the medicine, sitting in the chair. But this time he says, Deborah Martin. I said, yes, birthday. Yes. He says, you had cancer. 
Yes. I like those words. It was validating to me. You had not have. First sign. I went through the PET scan, put the white blanket on, felt the presence of God. And all of a sudden, I felt somebody hold this hand, this arm, and somebody hold this arm as they're up like this. And I go, who are you? And they said, it's us, your parents. We have not left your side. And I weep, and I weep, and I weep, and my hands are up like this. And they said, you did it. And as the machine comes out of that, as I come out of that machine and my hands are up, I'm like, do you know what I'm doing right now? Victory. My hands are up like a bee, victory. And I was like, in my mind going, yes. I don't know the results, but I'm like, we have victory here. And PET scan came back clear. And so I have been clear. This is, I have one more scan left. And so then I will be five years and it will be done. But I will tell you something. I started writing um, Doctor's Faith and Courage during my, while I had cancer, not knowing the outcome. I found out I had cancer on February 4th of 2019 on February 4th of 2020 this book was published you could not have lined that up any more perfect um it was meant to be so I have I wrote a list down because I know that I would forget to say everything but this these few things that I I want to give as tools First, I did is I let go and I let God. When I let go of all of the worries, the stresses, the concerns, I by doing that, you're saying them out loud. I'm really worried. I don't know what I'm going to face tomorrow. Dump it in the bucket. You're saying them out loud. You're giving them to God. And all of a sudden, you feel lighter. You feel so good. And it feels so wonderful. You have to trust everything is being put in, into your space and everything's in divine order. I couldn't see that right away, but as time processed, I could see that God was working behind the scenes the entire time, right down to my doctor's names. I walked through every door and some doors would close. Remember, I wanted to have my treatment done on the 10th and it wasn't happening that way. And I was like, what? One more day? When you go, when you have a goal set, that, that, that becomes, that's your everything. And when that goal is changed, even by a day, it's like, it, it, it flusters you. And you're like, what? I don't want another day. But I love the number 11. It had to be a perfect day, a divine day. You have to feel the heal. You have to embrace yourself. You have to allow yourself to cry. You have to ha have these emotions. You have... I'm telling you, this wasn't easy. From the the 45 minute drive after radiation home, I'd be like, "We have to find a place to stop, or I'm not going to make it home." I would lose my bowels from the radiation. Debilitating. So you, that's frustrating. But I also have to embrace it. And I just have to say, okay, this could happen. Let's find the places we could go. How do you walk through it with grace? Honor your body. Honor your truth. Honor how it's feeling. You're tired. You're tired. Don't push yourself. Positive attitude. Focus on not what's ahead, but where you are right now. And right now, like... Some of us could have anxiety right now. We could say, I'm feeling this anxiety coming up. Okay, then all of a sudden we get caught up in that feeling anxiety. I feel it. It's coming stronger. Take a deep breath and go, oh, wait. Yeah, I'm aware of it, but I'm safe. I'm okay. Fear into faith. We're all going to face fear. It's going to come knocking on our door. It just does. 
but I had to say to myself, how's that serving me? It wasn't. I had to turn it into faith. It goes back to letting go and letting God. Lessons I learned from cancer is um, find the people that are going to support you with positive energy, not to bring the negative and the drama in. You don't need that crap when you're trying to heal. Find one piece of joy in every day. I remember I couldn't even do laundry. I couldn't go to the grocery store. I couldn't do all these things that were wiped from me. And I can remember like, oh, grocery store. I get to do a load of laundry. I can tell you reality set in now where it's like, oh, I got to do laundry. It came back. But when you when that happens and that's stripped from you, I couldn't drive a car, you know? And so you look at, life so differently when something when you're facing death all of a sudden life becomes valuable and we need to look at every day as valuable um i learned to embrace every moment embracing the chemo pills embracing my doctors embracing my faith embracing my body and i embraced it all with love love heals Biggest, biggest thing is always tell your doctors and trust your intuition. If you don't like what they're saying, get a second opinion. Because you know your body better than they do. They're still practicing. They're still learning. Never give up hope. Hope always appears. And it's between you and God. Right? Embrace the love that surrounds you. It feels good, but cultivate a life of gratitude even during the difficult times. So that's my story, and I'm glad that I have the results that I do. Not all of us get those results, um, but even if you're not getting the results you want and you have a few days left here on Earth, you're going to go to a place that you're surrounded in love. So there's hope that way too.